أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وأعز المرسلين حبيب الله العالمين العبد المؤيد والنور المسدد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فيقول الحق وقوله الصدق في محكم التنزيل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما صدق الله العلي العظيم آمنا بالله ورسله For the acceleration of the reappearance of our awaited Imam Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajal Sharif I request to recite three salawat of the loudest of our voices please Allahumma salli ala Sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the most sacred and biggest commitments in the religion of Islam is the formation of what is called the family structure. This commitment has the most serious effect on the lives of nations and individuals. Like the, like the billions of the people who are present nowadays as a result of the blessed marriage of our father and mother, Adam and Eve. In the same way, the, the, in the same way we look at it when it comes to the details of the whole concept of the structure of marriage. In what sense? Is that one needs to take into consideration that a successful marriage will result in a successful family. And indeed, that successful family will help into the progress of the society. And also, if you look at it from the other side, is that a downfall of a marriage is indeed, will indeed it will result in a downfall of upbringing a family. And therefore, this might be the cause of disasters in the world. True, you will notice when you would look into history that the most famous criminals in the world, world dictators, people who have committed uh, crimes, you will notice that they were a result of an unstable family. A family that was full of, fa of problems. A family that was totally not stable in the sense of the relationship between the mother and the father. And resulting from this, we will dissect the whole concept of marriage tonight within two different areas. We will speak first about the definition of marriage in the religion of Islam. Is that what, how does Islam defines, uh, define marriage? And number two, we will look into the characteristics which need to be taken into consideration when choosing a spouse. Those two areas will explain to us the introduction of the topic of marriage. And inshallah, we will continue this if we have time. <coughs> Number one, one needs to understand that Islam does not look into the whole concept of marriage as the meeting of two physical bodies only. Not at all. Islam considers marriage as a form of an inner marriage, intermarriage of two souls, not only the bodies. This is how Islam looks at the whole concept of marriage. Why? You will notice what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah al -Rum. In Surah al -Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها. Now I'm sure you see this verse on wedding cards a lot. Every time you get a wedding card, you see this verse. What does this verse say? Allah is saying basically, and it is from His signs that He created from you and from yourselves, or He created for you from yourselves mates that you may that you may seek refuge to them. In what sense? Understand what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying. That number one. It is in fact when you meet the right person, that spouse that you get married to, you need to acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a spiritual, made a spiritual connection between both of you. So any other type of connection rather than the spiritual, uh, than the spiritual one is not good. That's first. Second, you need to understand that since that connection between both of you is on a spiritual level, then both of you need to work on a spiritual growth. That's something vital to be taken into consideration. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that He created for you. Meaning every person has a spouse created for him from what? From your souls, from your souls, mates. The third angle that you need to look at it from this verse is that He said, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا You see, the word sukun is what? Sallu ala The word sukun means what? Sukun comes from the word sakina. Truth? Sakina meaning tranquility, peace, comfort. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he's saying is that since he created for you from your soul's mates, he had made them as what? As people that you may seek comfort with them. That you may have that sukun, that tranquility. And therefore that word sukun comes from it, the word maskan, meaning what? Shelter. Is that a person feels comfortable in his house, true? He feels safe, he feels, comf uh, he feels comfort. And therefore that is the same exact feeling, that same exact feeling needs to occur when it comes to the spouse. That's the type of feeling that the both need to share with each other. And resulting from this verse, you will notice that the verse that we started with says what? وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا True? Allah was he's trying to say here, this verse is in the end of Surah Al-Furqan. The last verses of Surah Al-Furqan speak about the descriptions of Ibad al-Rahman. <coughs> Ibad al-Rahman meaning what? The servants of the beneficent God. True? Ibad al-Rahman. And some of, one of their descriptions is what? Because you see, the reason of a human being is not only to stay a abad, not only a slave, that you would rise to the level to become a abid, to a worshipper. That's why it is said, وَعِبَادُ Rahman. The descriptions of them are beautiful, and then at the end is what? It says, and those who say, O oh Allah, grant us from our wives and our offspring a comfort to our eye. And understand that terminology. Allah did not say that in the dua, you say, oh Allah, grant us a wife and children. No, no. It said that grant us from our wives and our children a comfort to our eye. Qurrat a'yun is what? The qurrat a'yun, the term qurrat a'yun, they say what? The scholars define it as everything that brings tears of joy to one's eye. And this is why they differentiate between the tears of joy and the tears of sorrow and sadness. That the tear of joy is indeed cold and it brings happiness. And therefore a person might shed a tear of joy. And this is the whole notion of the dua. The dua says, Oh Allah, grant us from our wives and our children. So the first key point is that the dua should be that Allah should grant you comfort to your eye from your wives and your children. Not only grant you a wife and not only grant you children. And this is the whole understanding of dua. See, sometimes, unfortunately, some people negotiate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like as if this whole notion of dua is a business deal. Oh Allah, you do this to me, and I'll do this back. Oh Allah, do this, and the same thing with another. For example, that only if this happens, okay, I will do this, fine. Yet when it comes to a dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you what? Call upon me and I will answer you. True? That indeed there's a condition. If you call upon me, I will answer you. But what? Call upon me. 
This is the only thing to take into consideration. Is that call, detach yourself from everything and then go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then what and then you say Allah is telling you call upon me and I will answer you. See, unfortunately, you will notice how sometimes people negotiate with Allah in terms of dua, huh? I was said that one time a man went to Hajj, and then as soon as he got to Hajj al Aswad, he got there and then he raised his hand in dua. Oh Allah, please, a million dollars. That's all what I want. Just a million dollars for me, Allah. Allah, one million dollars and I'll be set for life. If you give me a million dollars, I will worship, I will come to Hajj every year, I will go to the, I will do this, I will do just one million dollars. Then another man came on his right side and he said, Oh Allah, I don't want a million dollars, I just want one five hundred thousand dollars. That's all what I want. And then a person came on his left side said, Allah, I neither want a million nor I want five hundred thousand dollars. I just want fifty thousand dollars to pay my debt. That's it. Please, just grab me $50,000. So the person in the middle, what he did is that he looked at the one on his right wrote of a check with $500,000. And then he looked at the one with the, on the his left wrote of a check with $50,000. And then he looked back and he said, well, Allah, concentrate on me now. Forget those two. Sometimes this is the problem, is that you bracket Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that you think that you know what, that's it, that's it. You are the only one who exists in Allah, please concentrate on me. And this is the whole meaning when one time, Ayatollah Murtad al-Ansari rahmatullahi alayhi, that marja that they say he combined Arfan and Fiqh together. You see, one time he stepped into the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. Allah, 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 when he stepped into the shrine of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salamu alayhi, he found a man saying, Oh Allahumma zuqni. Oh Allah, give me rizq. Oh Allahumma rahamni. Oh Allah, have mercy on me. Ayatollah Muhammad al-Ansari mocked him. He stood beside him and he said, Me, 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 me. He kept on repeating this. And he said, Mulamu, are you making fun of me? He said, because don't you have that sense that Allah is generous? Why do you think that Allah is only for you? Is that challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that what? That oh Allah alhamna, have mercy on us. Oh Allah, give us rizq. This way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look down at you and he would say, if you think you're more generous than me that you're doing du'a for the rest, not only I will answer your call, but I will answer the call of the rest. So this is what one needs to take into consideration. One needs to understand the whole concept of du'a. And this is why this du'a came in this way. That oh Allah grant us from our wives and our children qurrata a'yun. Why? Let me explain something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no doubt that He acknowledges and since He created this desire in us, this sexual desire in a human being. He created you with it. True? Yet, what Allah is trying to tell you that since I created you with this desire, I want you to put it in the right direction. Why? You see, you will notice that unfortunately, when one has a bigger family, one sometimes might be very worried, working harder. So that whole concept of raising a family is not an easy concept, true? It's something very hard. You have to work hard. You're always worried. You want to guarantee a good future for your children. Imagine if what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put that, put that desire in you that gives you pleasure. If it did not give you pleasure, then who would ask for children? Nobody would ask for children. That's number one. Number two, if that desire did not give you pleasure, then obviously you won't be able to keep up with everything. True? Therefore you will notice, for example, when somebody, I don't know, his son does something to him, or his son gives him a hard time, what does he do? He may Allah curse that night. He would curse the night. Why? Because that night that gave him pleasure produced that son. Yet it is always that whole notion of pleasure that always he goes back to it. And therefore this is considered to be sukun and sakina. Is that this is the type of feeling that one should have with a spouse. True? That sakina, that sukun. And you will notice how sometimes, you know, a father, let's say his son would do something wrong, what would he do? He would blame the mother right away. See, this is your son. It's true? <laughs> and this is what he does. And if he was Pakistani, he'd blame the, he'd curse out the milk of the mother. That's it. <laughs> right away. Straight up. 
the small will have that. It was that milk. In what sense? You see, you understand that this is why a person would say, what? This is your son. Yet when someone, he, this son does something, what would they? This is my son. Obviously. So there's all this notion that one needs to understand that there's that interaction between the spouse, between him and the spouse. So that's why. And then we will move on to speak about why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided us with this feeling. And then he told us, you know what, put it in the right way. What is the right way? It's marriage. Marriage is the concept of what? What Allah is saying that marriage has to have rules and conditions. Without those conditions and characteristics, that marriage is not considered a true marriage, like we defined before. Is that Islam defines marriage as those two, that meeting of those two souls, not only the physical appearance of human beings. So this is what one needs to take into consideration that what? Therefore, the characteristics that I need to start looking into, and when I do look for a spouse, have to be dependent on that spiritual growth. Understand? So basically, the first characteristic that one needs to look into is what? Is faith. This is the characteristic that one needs to understand. This is the first one that should come at the top of the list. Faith in what sense? Faith in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created something called beautiful and something called good looking. The scholars of philosophy, they differentiate between them. They say what? Good looks are just a pure physical appearance. Beauty is what? Beauty is that kind of inner characteristics and inner attributes when completed in a person and when they are formed in a personality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cast his or hers love in others' hearts, no doubt. This is what beauty is. So one needs to look for what's beautiful, not what's good looking. And that's the difference. <coughs> and beautiful not according to your standards. Because you see, what we realize throughout the lectures in this Muharram, that there's a lot of definitions that we might choose, yet they do not apply in, re in reality. The reality of those definitions is not how we define them. Beautiful is what looks beautiful in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Islam teaches a human being to always be positive. Always be positive. Always look at something, find out, true? Don't they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Why? It's actually that beauty, not the good looks. Good looks, alhamdulillah, guys, all have one same standard of good looks. Everybody wants the same exact standard. That's when it comes to good looks. But beauty, this is what sometimes you might not understand. But only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understand understands and only the one who sees it understands. One of the beautiful stories that teaches us a lesson about this topic is the story of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Nabi Isa alayhi salam, one time he was walking with his companions, with his apostles, his students. And what happened is that they were crossing a desert and they saw a corpse of a dog. The dog was dead for a long time and then they saw his corpse. So well, obviously you can imagine how does it look. So he asked the first friend, the first apostle, he told him, what do you see? He said, I see an ugly, smelly dog. He asked the second one. He said, what do you see? He said, I also see an ugly, smelly dog. It smells bad, and it's ugly, it doesn't look good. And then he asked the third person, and he said, I also see a corpse of an ugly, dead dog. And then they both all looked at Nabi Isa alayhi salam, and they said, what do you see? He said, I see that his teeth are extremely white and glittering. So meaning that he found out one good quality about the corpse. And this is what Islam always teaches you. I mean, can you imagine Imam Zayn al-Abideen? Salawat Allah wa sallam. Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, imagine after the tragedy of Karbala, a man came to him and he asked him, what do you think of Yazid? He said, by God, he was a great poet. He mentioned one good characteristics about who? About who? Yazid. And that's extremely surprising. Actually, was stating a fact. So you would notice that Islam always teaches you to always look into something. Always find something positive, something productive, something that you might be able to look into. And therefore what they say is what? 
Look unto the faith when you're looking at a spouse. When you're choosing a spouse, always look unto the faith, not the person from the outside. Why? One of the other reasons is that you will understand that as long as this person has Iman, be it he or she, if they have Iman, then of course they will have Taqwa. And that Taqwa will prevent them from doing anything haram. Why? Because sometimes you might be away from each other for a while, might be traveling, working. So this person that's staying in the house, this is the person that needs to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. Since he will understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him or her, then this quality is something that will prevent them from anything else. And this is what's the first thing that you need to be looking at. <coughs> which is Iman and Taqwa. Another thing is that what? Within Iman and Taqwa is that one needs to be aware of the Islamic laws. True? Why? Because one of the things that you're going to do is that you're going to raise children, you're going to teach them, and in order for you to be able to teach them that you need to understand something, not just spend all day on TV, and not just spend all day shopping around, and you know, and the same thing. So therefore, there needs to be this up, some type of learning, and uh, that learning process that they need to have a background, a knowledgeable background, in order for them to be able to teach the kids. So this is why you need to understand that this is the whole notion of faith. So this is the first characteristic that one needs to take into consideration. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He summarizes this point by saying what? إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ لَهُ خُلُقًا وَدِينًا فَزَوِّجُوهُ وَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ One who comes to you, whom you accept his manners and his deen and his faith, then marry him. Understand what the Prophet said. Manners and faith. Deen needs to come with manners. Deen needs to come with akhlaq. Deen without akhlaq means nothing. Deen without akhlaq will result you to become an extremist. A person whose your thinking is extremely hard and nobody can deal with. Therefore, deen and akhlaq need to be present there, be it in the man or in the woman. Don't know. Because sometimes what I don't understand is that when you wear the hijab of Fatima, yet you act and you speak loud and you scream and yell and argue like as if you are the enemy of Fatima. This doesn't make sense. Or when you have the looks of Ali ibn Abi Talib, or you try you are the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Yet the way you argue and you speak and you present yourself outside is like the enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this is why the whole notion of la'na comes into place. In what sense? Shaheed al-Sadr rahmatullahi alayhi so he explains it beautifully. He tells to his students, it is easy to curse the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. But has any of us ever got the power and the government of Harun al-Abbasi, Harun al-Rashid? Maybe if we would have got the power of Harun al-Abbasi, we would be the first people who would imprison our Imam. Yeah. And there's no doubt about it. Understanding this, true? Why? I mean, don't go too far. And this is exactly what we do even when it comes to the process of marriage. We are the first people who would oppose our own Imam. Rasulullah tells us what? That always look at the manners of, and the faith. We tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know Rasulullah, thank you, this is Canada, this is the one. You don't understand, we do. Hmm. This is what happens all the time. This is exactly what happens, and this is the reality. You see, there are buttons that I know sometimes that are really sensitive to push. Yet when you see corruption around you in society, when you see teenagers and youths are taking the path of haram, and I wish it was the path of haram that we were dealing with yesterday, and this is not what the community deals with. No, no, it is always the mawlanas that the speakers deal with. Because this is what happens all the time, is that that's when the speakers and the mulana come into place. Is that when the community realizes that the children and the youth and the teenagers are drowning. But it's too late. Now, they're in quicksand. In what sense? Quicksand is a different type of drowning. The more you fight, the more you drown. Because now when you're trying to take them out, it's hard. Why? Because the whole notion of preaching marriage became taboo. That's wrong. Preaching marriage begins something that one does not want to deal with. You know, subhanAllah, you sit down on this number, you preach marriage, you know what, Mawlana, maybe this is not the right time for it. Fine. You speak about hijab, Mawlana, you know what, you might harm the feelings. Fine. You speak about the beard, the Islamic look of a guy, how should you? 
Mawlana, this might harm the feeling of the. Then what do you speak of this member? Huh? Reminds me of this uh, incident. One of the one woman is married to a Sunni brother. So she had uh, that person in her family, her father died away, she wanted to make a majlis in her house. So she called the Mawlana. Said, Mawlana, I want to make a majlis in my house. But please, if you don't mind, take into consideration that my, my husband is Sunni from Ahlul Sunnah. I said, okay, fine, no problem. She said, so if you want to speak anything bad about Bani Umayyah, Bani Abbas, no problem. Well, don't speak about the previous Khalifa, because he'll get sensitive. He said, okay, no problem. So the Mawlana went to her house, he sat on the chair, he started the majlis, he started the speech. When he's talking, when he was talking, he started speaking and then he came up, he started speaking about Abu Sufyan. So she winked at him, but don't speak about us. Okay, fine. Then he goes on, he spoke about Muawiyah, he's talking about Muawiyah. Then she also winked at him again, but please don't speak about Muawiyah. What? She don't understand. Then he was started with Yazid, same thing with him. Then he said, brothers and sisters, Imam Hussein died with a car crash and a car crash. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, sometimes this is what, you, what happens. Is that you sit down and you speak in front of this number about those issues. That these issues need an applicable sense to them. That one needs to learn and understand. And these are the sensitive issues that need to be spoken about. The, this is how the whole notion of society becomes complete. This is the way it is. So when Rasulullah says, uh, says when somebody comes to you, that you accept his faith and deen, marry him. And if you don't, what are you doing? And if you don't, then indeed you are spreading fitna, dispute, and the great corruption. Not only corruption, a great corruption. So these are the characteristics that when a person comes to you and he proposes, these are the characteristics that you need to ask about. These are the exact characteristics that you need to ask about. True? So therefore, the first, the first characteristics that one needs to look into is the characteristic of Iman. That's one. Two, one needs to understand that throughout the whole process of this, now one needs to look into that internal attractiveness. Meaning what? There's the whole notion of attractiveness, true? That everybody wants to be attracted to a spouse and the vice versa. Yet look for that internal attractiveness. Look for those inner qualities. And like we said before, this is the inner type of beauty. This is the difference between beauty and good looks. That inner attractiveness that one might see, that reflection of Iman and the love of Ahlul Bayt. When that love is there, and that strong aqidah, and that application of deen, then you will see that internal attractiveness. True? The third notion that one needs to take into consideration. The one what we say is basically that the two need to be compatible. In what sense? You see, when we say compatible, that doesn't, yeah, meaning what? That they need to be kuf. In what sense? Not in anything else except knowledge, edu education, alam, and deen. In what sense also? That doesn't mean that knowledge and education, that know it's a must, that since you are a graduate of Harvard, that he needs to be a graduate of Harvard. No. Or if you are, let's say, for example, in the, in the school of law, that he has to be an engineer. There isn't one thing in Islam that says that. And the father who refuses to marry his daughter to somebody, just because, let's say, for example, if he doesn't hold that high of a university degree, is doing a big mistake. And he falls into the category of spreading fitna and what great corruption in this world. What needs to be compatible is that, that sense of knowledge, that alim. Meaning what? Meaning, yes, it is your right not to accept as a girl or a boy, be it a boy or a girl that are not knowledgeable. They're ignorant, they don't have a knowledgeable background, which is important, yes. Every, why? Because what we said earlier is that you want to teach those children and you want that influence to happen. It's to be, there has to be an exchange, meaning one part should influence the other. And when this happens is that obviously they need to have a knowledgeable background. When they have a knowledgeable background, they will be able to teach and spread the knowledge. I mean, they will be able to affect you. True? When that type of affection happens, then you will notice that the relationship will continue. Why? Because there, there, there's this whole sense of dialogue. When this whole sense of dialogue happens, because there is knowledge being shared, and there's an educational background, then dialogue will wipe out arguments. Arguments might not break out. But this is the problem, I personally say. This is my personal opinion. I know there's nothing that says it's haram or any fiqh of ruling about it. Yet I don't believe in something called international marriage. 
That international marriage, I personally, I would rather not have any. In what sense? A boy or a girl that are born and raised here. So let's say they gave their parents a hard time, or let's say not. Let's say they didn't get married here. Then their parents take them back, be it to Lebanon, to Iraq, to Pakistan, to Kenya, wherever it is, and then they bring a spouse and they come back. <coughs> you see, number one, if this process happens too fast, I personally don't understand it. Why? So you step into, let's say, for example, you're back from country, and then in two months, boom, they love each other. How is that? I'm sure. How did he fall in love with you? In two months? In the... And besides, let's say he did. Imam Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Sadiq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, love the woman you marry. Don't marry the woman you love. And everyone sits down and says, no, 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 but there has to be love. No, 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 no. That, not that type of love that you're talking about. The love that you're talking about is that love of deen. What we defined friendship last night was what? We said that whole notion of the two parties loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you both love Allah Muhammad and Allah Muhammad, then that love will develop greater after marriage. <coughs> How many people ended up getting married out of love, yet those, this love did not stay? True. Therefore, you will take into consideration that the whole notion of marrying from outside, I believe personally that whoever is born and raised here should marry whoever is born and raised, uh, and raised here. Why? You see, there is that difference of mentality. When that difference of mentality occurs, meaning some people from back home, they have certain expectations. They're raised in a certain way and you're raised in a different way. We're not going to discuss who's right and who's wrong. But we're just going to say that since you raised here in a certain way, then you need to be able that the only way you're going to get, for example, along with somebody, is that somebody who's also raised here, somebody who thinks like you, somebody who's on the same level. And this is the problem, that's why some divorces are happening. Is that, let's say for example, one of the sisters travels back home, sits down, meets a guy, you know, falls in love with her Canadian passport. Excuse me, sorry. Falls in love with her personality, mashallah. <laughs> when he falls in love with her personality, of course, you know, she brings him here. You know, and this is what happens when she brings him here. This is when they both get shocked. They don't understand what's going on. He has certain... Why? Because back home they were having fun, going out, enjoying their time. And this leads me to the third characteristic that one needs to take into consideration in the process of marriage, which is what? Observing Islamic conduct. In what sense? You see, I said earlier, you sit down with a person to meet, and let's say the parents agree, and let's say they're compatible, and let's say all the characteristics are available, they're present, and then you sit down to meet and you start talking. There has to be a limit for this. Meaning, do not celebrate that, okay, fine, now the parents, they agree to it, they have already accepted it, so therefore I have my total freedom. No. Why? Because what you might have in terms of feelings before will develop into something haram. And you don't want that haram to start. The worst thing to do is to actually start your life of haram. When you start with your life of haram, it's going to be hard to fix later on. So therefore, you need to take into consideration this Islamic conduct. And this brings me back to what, that point of international marriage, is that observe, take your time, and understand what the intention is in the other party. That's what you need to be able to understand. When you take these things into consideration, and you look within, and be able to acknowledge somebody's personality, this is where tawakkul comes into place. That tawakkul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will make you rise to the level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make your life perfect. And as long as you always have that deen as the goal. Muqaddas al-Ardabili rahmatullahi alayhi. I don't know if you've heard of Muqaddas al-Ardabili. One of the greatest scholars. One of the greatest maraja' at his time. Muqaddas al-Ardabili was known, that's why he was given that title, Muqaddas. He was known to be one of the great maraja' one of the great scholars, one of the people who actually, until this day, you hear their stories. That to the point he was so humble, he resembled humbleness. But even one time it is said that he walked into the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and then he saw a man, one of the Zawar, one of the people visiting Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
And then when that person came, had his clothes, and then he asked Muqaddas al they didn't know who he was, and then he asked them if he knows somewhere that he can wash these clothes. Muqaddas al took them from him, and he said, don't worry, I'll bring them back to you tomorrow. He went home and he washed them, imagine, and then he brought them back to him the next day. The people in the Hamra, they told him, do you know who just washed your clothes? He said, no, he said, that's Muqaddas al the Majah at the time. That's SubhanAllah. So imagine, and then that man came and apologized to him. Muqaddas al told him, no, 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 I'm the one who needs to thank you that you actually gave me the honor to wash the clothes of a person who came to visit Imam Ali. <coughs> so imagine, Muqaddas al is what? The reason he became Muqaddas, and the reason he became and rise to this level to be given this title. And it is said that he had meetings with Imam al Zaman, Ajallah Ta'ala, Ajallah Shabir. It is said that one time his father, his father was a very pious man, mu'min, a person who took the Islamic cause into consideration all the time throughout his life, always was aware that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is watching him. So, what happened is that one time his father was out on the riverside was on a side of a river, a place that contained a lot of gardens around it. And then he saw an apple in the water. So what he did is that he picked up the apple and he ate it. Then he realized that actually maybe that apple belongs to somebody. And it fell from, it, from their tree. And that's how specific he was when it came to the whole, the whole understanding of fiqh. So what happened is that he decided to walk the opposite way of the river flow and then to see if there's somebody there. And he did see a person picking up apples from a tree from his own garden. And some of those apples were falling into the water. So he realized that that apple is for this person. And then he went to him. He looked at him and he said, I just came to ask you if those apples belong to you. He said, yes. He said, well, if you don't mind, I didn't take your permission, but a bit further, I picked up one of those apples that fell into the water and I ate it. And I felt guilty that maybe I should have asked for permission, huh? Compare it to nowadays. <laughs> what do we do without permission every day? I wish it comes only to an apple. Everything is without permission. Permission doesn't even exist to begin with. What permission? Everything that we do is out of no permission. Is that how many times do we take permission from Imam al-Zaman, Hashanah al Fajr how many times do we actually involve Imam al-Zaman with our actions? True? So the father of Muqaddas al what he did is that he asked this person, he told him, I would I'd like to ask for your forgiveness, and if you don't, then I would like to pay for this apple. He said, you know what? I don't want your money, and I don't want you to pay me for the apple, and I'm not going to accept, and I'm not going to forgive you. He said, then what do you want me to do? He said, I have a condition. He said, well, I'll just give you a choice. If you want, I'll pay you for the apple, and if you want, no, just Forgive me, he said, no, 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 by God, I'll stand on judgment day. But I have one condition if you really want me to forgive you. So he told him, what, what's that condition? He said, I have a daughter at home. And that daughter is disabled. She doesn't walk. And she's deaf. She's blind and she's mute. The perfect wife. <laughs> he doesn't like that. <laughs> The perfect wife, alhamdulillah, I will realize why. SubhanAllah, a lot of us sometimes might see. Yet I wish this sight really serves us well. And a lot of us sometimes might walk. Yet I wish that walking goes, we were walking as the true people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as just two-legged creatures. A lot of us might think this all the senses we have are a na'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet in the sense we use them as a na'mah. Not as, a, as a curse. So this is why it is said what? What happened is that he told him, this is my daughter. And this is the only way I'll forgive you. So then, the father of Muqaddas said, he said, okay, you know what? Sure. I accept. And he wasn't married at that time. When he went and he sat down, they recited the nikah. And then he went into the bedroom to see her. He didn't even see her. I mean, what to see her? Huh? A lot of us would be running away at this point. And he sat down and he realized that this daughter that he's talking about is the exact opposite of everything he said. And when he asked him, he came outside the bedroom, he said, well, I think you just married me to the one daughter, that's not the one you were just describing. He said, yes. 
And that's the one who said, well, I went inside and I saw a beautiful woman. Her eyes are beautiful, she appears well, she walks well, nothing is wrong with her. He just told me that she's disabled, she's deaf, she's new, she's... He said, you know something, this girl gave me a hard time. I said, what do you mean? He said, she's too religious. She's over-religious. She's very keen about her Islamic laws. And this is why we call her the deaf, the mute, the blind, and the handicapped. Meaning what? Meaning she refuses to hear anything if it was not the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we call her deaf. And she's blind because she never looked into a haram ever in her life. And she never looked into another stranger man in a different way. And she's a handicapped, she's disabled, she never walked because she never walked out of this house because she found no point for it, she always stayed in her ibadah. And she's mute because she never, she always stops her tongue from ghibah, namima, gossip, anything to be mentioned in haram, except the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you came to me, being specific and detailed about an apple that you ate, then I realized that there is somebody like my daughter. And when I realized there is somebody like my daughter, that's when I want to take advantage of the opportunity. That I should, you should only marry her. And what was the result of their marriage? Now you will realize that when you pick a spouse according to the Islamic belief, according to the love of Muhammad and Muhammad, then this is what Allah brings out from you. And this is why we said in the beginning of the lecture that that shahwa, that desire, put it in the right place and it will give birth to anbiya and the ahma. And it will give birth to infallibles. Or their companions or their followers. And put it in haram, it will give birth to the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt. Give birth to criminals, dictators and tyrants in the world. And when they asked the mother of Muqaddas al-Ardabili that how did your son rise to this level? I mean, when you speak about Muqaddas, I know for God's sake, there are so many stories you can say about him. Yet imagine to the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misses him. In what sense? You see, when you're waiting for somebody, and you love this person, and if a per person delayed, what do you do? You call them and you tell them, you know what? What's wrong with you? I'm waiting for you. I'm going to sit down with you. Muqaddas al-Adamiya is narrated that one time he was sitting in his house and he was sewing. Salat al dhuhr time came. So what he did, he said, I'm just going to finish this needle, this last thread, and I'll get up to do wudu and pray. So what happened is that he finished the last thread, he put it down, he went up, he threw the bucket into the water, into the well. When he picked it up, he found that it was full of gold and coins and jewelry. What does Muqaddas al do? Huh? Put yourself in his shoes. That's it, jackpot. He had the jackpot. Muqaddas al gets angry and gets offended. And he throws it back into the well. Then he raises his hand in dua. And he cries. And he says, oh Allah, I want water so I can go meet you. I don't want gold and jewelry. No. I don't understand how he realizes the difference as what. Well. And then he has said that he heard a voice saying, Ya Ahmad, his name was Ahmad al-Ardabili. Ya Ahmad, if you want dunya, then you sh if you want Allah, and if you want to come and meet me, then you should have been, shouldn't have been late. And therefore, I wanted to tell you that if you want dunya, then take gold. But if you want Allah, then next time, leave the thread and come to me fast. Right. And imagine that Muqaddas is a result of what? Is that marriage. And then, therefore, they see that this is what? One of the very important characteristics of finding a wife. The fourth one that I'm just going to end with, and inshallah, we'll be able to continue this topic tomorrow, inshallah, and we'll be able to dissect it more and understand the whole concept so we can come up with a conclusion at least. When we speak about a topic, we would like to always conclude, always have a result. That what does it teach us? And what is the point of it? The last but not least is finding the qualities of a father and a mother. And the other person. Meaning what? That when you meet a person, don't only take that is sufficient that mu'min or mu'mina. Taqwa, fine. Educated, fine. All the qualities, but then you know what? They might say that I do not want to be a parent. Or they might not be ready to raise a child. And if they are not ready to raise a child, 
then you will face a problem. And if you're not ready to, face a, to raise a child, then you will face a problem too. So therefore, they need to have the capacity and the capability in order for them to understand that they're going to become parents. And if they become parents, then there has to be that notion of sacrifice, of being able to raise that child. And this is what truly really happened when it comes to always the Anbiya. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that whoever they marry that would bring other Anbiya, or whoever they would marry to bring other A'imma, for example, were always people that were purified. People that were totally pu uh, pure and were able to understand that their role is the sacrifice. True? Look at Umm al-Baneen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayha. For example, that whole notion of sacrifice to bring Abbas alayhi salam. That he told her he will be killed. And she took that sacrifice and understood that life of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence all the mothers on the land of Karbala <coughs> were the exact meaning, and they manifested the whole concept of sacrifice. Look at the mother for Wahab, of Wahab, the Christian, the one who martyred with Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. Not only her son was a newly wed, he actually entered the battlefield, and when they killed him, they brought his head, and they threw it to his mother. His mother captured the head and threw it back to them and told them in our custom we do not take a sacrifice that we gave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the true mothers and fathers that raise. And this is why you will hear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he would say, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. What does this mean? That Husayn is from me and I am from Husayn. This is true. Hussein is from me, that's we understood. And he is from Rasulullah. Then how is Rasulullah from Hussein? It all has to do with sacrifice. You see, Rasulullah is a descendant of Nabi Ibrahim. From his son, Ismail. The one who was supposed to be sacrificed. True? If Nabi Ibrahim's son, Ismail, was sacrificed, then would Rasulullah have been born? No. Yet when Nabi Ibrahim they told him that we have replaced that sacrifice. You, we replaced your son with who? With Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi. That he took the burden of sacrifice. Therefore Rasulullah says, and I am from Hussein. Wow. It is the sacrifice of Hussein that was the result of the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He took the sacrifice of Nabi Ismail. And therefore Rasulullah was born. And therefore Nabi, uh, Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi, Realize at that point that just like Rasulullah is able to sacrifice, I'm able to sacrifice. Or else, how do you think Imam Hussein was able to sacrifice all these children? Just one after the other, take them. Oh Allah, and I said before, he raises his hand in dua and he says, Oh Allah, take until you're pleased. Until you're pleased, just keep on taking until Allah took him even too. And this is the whole notion of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Ali ibn Abi Talib that sleep in my bed so you can be you might be a sacrifice for me, true? Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam accepts. When the father accepts, obviously he's going to raise the son on, upon the concept of sacrifice. When the father does something in the house, then obviously it's the son that who's going to learn. True? So when Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam sleeps in the bed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and accepts that he might die, for the love of Rasulullah, then Hussein will do this. And when Rasulullah takes Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, and Sayyid al-Zahra and Imam Amir Mu'min sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into Mubahala. True? In Mubahala what happened is that Rasulullah was ready to sacrifice his whole family for that deen. True? And therefore Imam Hussain alayhi salam took Ali ibn Asghar to the battlefield. The narration says that when Imam Hussain alayhi salam looked around him and there was nobody else. <laughs> he looked back at the camp of Bani Hashim and he screamed out, ah, who did he call for? Ya Abbas, Ya Abul Fad. <coughs> Imam Hussein alayhi salam remembers his brother Abbas and then he walks back to the camp. Sayyidah Zainab salam comes out. He sees that Sayyidah Zainab salam 
comes out from one tent to another. What is she doing? Huh? She's going around the tents of Bani Hashem with a child in her hand. He comes to her and he said, Oh, my sister Zainab, what is wrong with you? She said, Your wife Rabab gave me your infant Aliyul Asghar. And she said, Oh, Bani Hashem, this is your infant. infant. He's going to die from thirst. Speak him and water him. Therefore, you will not Hussein uh, looked at Sayyidah Zainab running from one tent to another. And then he remembered that this is not the only time that she will be running from one tent to another. That there will come a time that she will be running from one tent to another. When? Huh? When the fire <laughs> surrounds the tents of the woman of Bani Hashim. <laughs> at this point, Imam Hussein alayhi salam told Sayyidah Zainab, Give me that infant, oh my sister Zainab. When she took him, when he took him, <laughs> he looked at him before he takes him to the battlefield. <laughs> he looks at his face and he says, Oh my son, we will be upon a people who will kill you. <laughs> And then he carries Ali al Asghar. The narration says that he rode his camel and he went and stood in front of the army of Yazid. And he said to Umar ibn Sa'd, Oh Umar ibn Sa'd, you have killed my brothers, you have killed my sons, my nephew, yet there is only that son remaining. He's done nothing and he's only a six months old infant and he's going to die from thirst. Hamid ibn Muslim says when we looked at the infant, he was already fainted from thirst. At this point, the army of Yazid split into two. Ones are saying, give water for that infant. He has no, he, there is nothing that he did. And another saying, no, wipe out all Bani Hashim, don't leave any of them. At this point, Umar ibn Sa'ad, ya Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad looked at Harmala. And he says, oh Harmala, oh Harmala, solve this issue. Harmala understood what Umar ibn Sa'ad told him. <laughs> forward a little bit. When Mukhtar brought Harmala, he stood there and he said, Oh Harmala, I just have one question for you. And he said, what Mukhtar? He said, when you, before you shot that arrow, did you feel any mercy in your heart, Oh Harmala? Harmala said, by God, Mukhtar, I did. He said, how? Huh? And now listen to the maqtal on the tongue of Harmala. Harmala says, by God, when Imam Hussein lifted up that child, and Umar ibn Sa'ad told me to shoot the arrow, I looked at the infant Ali al Asghar, and I realized that I can't see anywhere that I can really shoot him from. <laughs> and at this point, a breeze of wind blew. And he was wrapped. And then I saw his neck shining like a pot of silver. So I took an arrow and I put it in my bow. And I shot the child. And the arrow landed right on his neck and it went from the other side. Oh, Mukhtar, note that by God, that when the arrow landed on the neck of the child, he woke up and he started moving his hand like a bird. He was just small, Mukhtar. Yet he hugged the neck of his father. <laughs> Imam Hussain 
carried the blood that came down from the neck of Ali al Azhar and he threw it in the sky. And he said, Oh Allah, let his punishment not be less than the punishment of the one who slaughtered the camel of Salah. And he went back to the camp. Who was waiting for Hussein there, huh? His daughter was <laughs> So Kaina tells her father, Oh Hussein, did you give water to Ali al Azra and leave me some, huh? He tells her, Oh my daughter, so Kaina, take Ali al Azra. A dead, thirsty. <laughs> The narration says that Imam Hussein didn't even dig a grave for Ali al Azhar. With the back of his sword, he moved the sand and he buried him. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Wa sayyalabu alladhi adhamu ala muhammadin ayyam al-qalabin yaqtaribun wa al-aqibatu al-muhtaqin. Allahumma kuli walika al-hujat ibn al-hasan salawatika alayhi wa ala abaih. في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا معينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلي اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين